very much for that introduction, and thanks for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I think this house has been renovated beautifully, and um, I'm hopeful that uh, you'll see many more uh, sort of intellectual exchanges in this room and in the house here. I think it's uh, really a great asset and a great uh, tribute to Adam Smith. Um, I should say before I start that this is an academic talk. It's a talk I've given uh, before. If you want to see other versions of it, it has been recorded before. They are on my, on my webpage. But I'm looking forward to trying to generate a good discussion here today. This is a joint work with uh, Ricardo Ducencio, St. Louis Fed. Uh, so optimal monetary policy for the masses. So this is going to follow on the income inequality uh, theme that we've seen some of already today. There we go. This is a boring slide, so we'll go past it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Adam Smith argued that uh, when everyone pursues their own uh, self-interest, uh, you get the best allocation of resources in the society. But he was also uh, very aware of income inequality, wherever there's great property, there's great inequality. And you might wonder if those views are contradictory. Um, and, and I guess that's how I want to frame this, uh, this talk here. There is a, letter, a literature on heterogeneity and monetary policy that will help us think about whether you can get to the best allocation of resources, even when there's a lot of heterogeneity, a lot of uh, inequality in the society. So the key question for this paper is whether uh, monetary policy can be conducted in a way that benefits all households, even in a world with substantial heterogeneity. And I'm going to give you a very Adam Smithy answer. Uh, it's going to be yes, uh, you can do it, or at least in this economy, in this particular uh, economy that I'm going to draw up, uh, you can do it. So if you read the recent literature on uh, heterogeneous households and monetary policy, uh, you, probably, you might get a different impression. So this Capamobilante paper, which is getting a lot of attention, uh, that's uh, heterogeneous agent economy. You've got uh, different households are hit by different shocks, and you have uh, aggregate shock as well, it's new Keynesian friction, and uh, that leads to a complicated situation where it's hard to determine uh, what the best monetary policy is, and in particular, the monetary policy transmission mechanism is substantially altered. Um, so it kind of gives you the impression, although they don't really say this, but the impression that if you got serious about the heterogeneity in the economy, there would be no way that the kinds of things that we're doing as central bankers today are, are even close to what you, what you uh, ideally like to be doing. And uh, similarly with this uh, Bandari et al. paper, uh, kind of similar, uh, they have a nominal friction in complete markets, heterogeneous households, they get reasonable Gini coefficients, so they do try to match the data in that dimension. And they do a Ramsey problem and uh, the optimal monetary fiscal policy doesn't look like the kinds of things that we see actual governments doing or actual central banks doing. And, and in particular, it doesn't look like Taylor rules and, and things like that. So I would take these papers to be saying that, uh, uh, you know, if you're gonna get serious about it, it's gonna be pretty difficult to rationalize uh, what central banks claim to be doing. But uh, our paper is gonna come to a different conclusion uh, we'll also have incomplete markets and nominal friction. We also have reasonable Gini coefficients in this paper. I'll spend some time on that. And uh, we're going to have an optimal monetary policy that is uh, uh, easily described in terms of the kinds of things people talk about today. And in particular, it will be nominal GDP targeting in this paper. It's going to work great, and it's going to work to uh, help everybody in the in the society. So that's kind of the punchline of this paper. If you want to see some other papers on uh, the burgeoning literature on monetary policy and inequality, uh, you can see this conference that we had in 2015. Uh, that's on our web page. So what's going to happen in this model is that uh, Monetary policy is going to rep repair the uh, the 
problem in private credit markets, so we're going to complete markets uh, with monetary policy. And the optimal policy is going to look like now in the GDP targeting. Uh, the hallmark of that is counter-cyclical price level movements. So in good times, you um, lower the price level. Uh, and in bad times, you raise the price level. And that continues to hold that this is the main contribution of this particular paper. This is one in a series of papers I've been writing on this. But uh, in this paper, we have the, the so-called mass of heterogeneity, enough heterogeneity to get uh, uh, income, financial wealth, and consumption and equality genies uh, in the US. So if you don't want to listen to anything else, uh, you just take this line in italics. Uh, novel GDP targeting constitutes optimal monetary policy for the masses. Um, I'm going to kind of glide through the environment here, and then I'm going to show you some pictures. To me, the pictures uh, are worth a thousand words. So I think uh, hopefully when we get to the pictures, we'll, uh, we'll be able to decipher what's going on. So first of all, this is overlapping generations. So these are life cycle, this is a life cycle model. And we're talking many period overlapping generations. So you basically, if you don't work with these models, I mean, you're talking about people come into something like age 20 when they start making economic decisions. They're gonna live for a bunch of quarters. We're gonna have it be a quarterly model. And then they're gonna die uh, sometime later and at a fixed time, and then uh, they're gonna have like 60 years, of course, so that's two, 240, we're actually gonna have 241 periods here. Um, these uh, guys are going to have only one asset in this model is privately issued uh, debt, and I'm gonna talk about that. There'll be real interest rates and inflation. And I want you to think about this privately issued debt as uh, something like mortgage-backed securities. So what's going to go on in this economy is that um, you know, you're going to be less productive early in your life cycle, pretty productive in the middle part of the life cycle, and not very productive in the late part of the life cycle. So what you want to do is you want to borrow when you're young, and you want to pull consumption forward in the life cycle. So you could think of that as wanting to pull housing services uh, forward so that you can consume the housing uh, when you're raising families and stuff like that. We don't have anything like that actually in the model. This is a very abstract model, so don't take me literally. That's just how I want you to think about the one asset that's in this model. And I want to emphasize it's privately issued debt. So you know what's happening is you're it's time to buy a house. You're writing down on a piece of paper, I want to borrow uh, you know, hundred thousand pounds, and and I give you the piece of paper, then I'm gonna pay you back uh, later at a fixed time on which trade. So there's no government debt or anything like that. There, there's uh, this privately issued debt. There's no government spending, there are no taxes of any kind. Uh, we could add that or we could talk about that uh, in a little bit here. Now, uh, I've worked a lot on life cycle models and uh, I'm telling you we, we've got the coolest trick ever here, which is <laughs> symmetry assumptions. So this is a model that's going to have an aggregate shock. It's going to have a zillion households in it. And I'm still going to be able to solve it with pencil and paper. Now, usually when you do models like this, you, know, you immediately have to do calibration and have to do a computational solution. It's not true here. We're going to get an exact pencil and paper solution by making symmetry assumptions. So the key part to the symmetry assumption is that when you're born in this model, you come into the, the, economic, the part of the, your life cycle where you get to make your own economic decisions, you are going to get handed a pro personal productivity profile. And this personal productivity profile is just like I just described it, basically low productivity early, high productivity in the middle, low productivity late in life. We're going to make that pattern be perfectly symmetric perfectly symmetric over your 241 quarters that you're going to live. And not only that, but the peak period is exactly in the middle of life. So you can use really any pattern that you want as long as you meet the symmetry uh, criterion. So think of a triangle, for instance, that would work fine. We're going to have this kind of gradual hump-shaped thing. But you could do a lot of different things uh, that would meet this uh, symmetry assumption. And um, we're going to do other uh, 
uh, nice things like lot uh, preferences, uh, no discounting, no discounting. So you don't need discounting in the uh, in the overlapping generations model. So if you're thinking about a beta, that beta is going to be one, okay, and that's very helpful as well. And uh, you can put that back in. This 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 is these are simplifying assumptions. No population growth. So what that's going to do? Uh, these symmetry assumptions are going to give us this uh, this uh, result that the real interest rate in the economy is exactly equal to the output growth rate even in the stochastic economy. So you're going to have this aggregate shock, and the real interest rate's going to be bouncing around. But that's OK. We can guess and verify that that's exactly the solution for this uh, economy. So you can think of that as the Wicksellian uh, natural rate of interest. If you're familiar with new Keynesian models, they would have a Wicksellian natural rate of interest. We have that here. And uh, the gist of uh, monetary policy is always to get back to the Wicksellian natural rate of interest and have that be the rate of interest in the economy. So that's exactly what monetary policy is going to do here. And at the very end, I'll talk uh, more about um, thinking about policy in interest rate terms. So we're going to get all these nice, easy to understand, or at least in my head, uh, <laughs> easy to understand baseline uh, results for this economy through this, uh, these symmetry assumptions. So you've got this quarterly DSG life cycle endowment economy. It's an endowment economy. There's no capital. You can think of capital as being fixed. Uh, this is similar to the basic New Keynesian uh, assumption. Um, and then each period, a new cohort of uh, uh, households is going to enter the economy. Um, there's going to be a whole lot of these guys now. Uh, I'll show you in a minute. Um, so. And they'll all be handed a different uh, productivity profile, and that's going to be a big part of what we're uh, what we're doing here. And there's just the one asset in the model, the uh, privately issued uh, debt, or if you if you know the theory of OLG, you know you often call these consumption loans. I write a piece of paper to you and promise to pay you back next period. You give me some of the consumption good today. The monetary authority is just going to control the price level, the nominal price level P uh, directly. Um, we have money versions that have money demand and all that stuff in there. It's just a lot simpler just to chuck all that for, the, for purposes of this talk. It doesn't shouldn't make any difference. If you want to see the money demand version, see the earlier paper. Households have log preferences. So this, for those of you that care, uh, it's. Eta log C plus 1 minus eta log L, where L is leisure. So there is going to be labor and leisure here, so I'm going to consume that uh, you know, leisure. And then uh, if you're familiar with these kinds of models, you know, you might be thinking borrowing constraints, but there are no borrowing constraints here. Uh, this is a flexible price model. There's no default here. So when I promise to repay you next period, I really am going to repay. So we're not messing around with it. Uh, default, there's a uh, fixed capital, no population group. And then there's just the one friction in the model, which is non state contingent uh, nominal contracting. And uh, so, what does this mean? Uh, it means that when I want to uh, borrow, I'm going to borrow in nominal terms, and uh, it's not going to be contingent on how well the, uh, where the shot comes out in the next period. So there are two aspects to this. One aspect is that because it's not state contingent, the real allocation of resources is uh, disturbed you know, from what it would otherwise be if there was uh, proper contracting in this economy. And because it's in nominal terms and the, and the central bank controls the price level, the central bank might be able to fix this uh, friction in the economy and return you to a situation where you had real state contingent contracting. So we're not investigating this at all uh, if any further in this paper. We're just assuming this and see where it takes us. But uh, there, there is a literature that talks a lot about uh, all the nominal contracts that are out there in the world. And it does seem like there's not a lot of state con real state contingent contracting that goes on. Uh, <clears throat> There's a production in this economy. It's, uh, it's uh, linear in labor, so LT will be the aggregate labor input. Um, 
aggregate effective labor input. Now you've got people making decisions about how many hours to work, and people have different productivity levels, and they might also be at different points in their life cycle. So there's kind of a lot to keep track of for the labor input. But whatever the labor input comes out to be, uh, we're just going to multiply that by Q, and we'll get output. Q is the level of technology. Um, it's going to turn out that that L is uh, actually constant in the equilibrium that we talked about. So I'm going to come back to that uh, later. And then this, uh, this Q will grow over time. So it's a growing economy. And it's going to grow at a stochastic rate lambda between date t and uh, t plus 1 here, uh, aggregate gross rate uh, lambda. And uh, that means that the wage is going to be given by Q. And so the wage is also going to grow at this exogenous rate uh, lambda. And uh, this is going to, lambda is going to be given by this first order uh, serially correlated uh, process. <coughs> Rho is the serial correlation parameter. Uh, sigma is the scaling parameter. So the economy, if there was no shocks, the economy will grow at, at lambda bar uh, over time. So think about that as a number like 1.02 or 1.03. Now, these shocks could actually be big enough in this economy that you would hit the zero lower bound on nominal interest rates. Uh, we don't want to allow that in this particular paper. If you want to look at that issue, go back to the earlier paper with uh, Zariata et al. So we're going to put bounds on this uh, on this uh, process for epsilon so that we don't hit the zero lower bound. And there's an all important timing protocol in this model, and maybe in all models, uh, monetary policy. But uh, nature goes first. Nature chooses a value for epsilon, which determines the growth rate of lambda. Uh, policymaker gets to see this and gets to decide what to do with the price level P after observing the shock. After all of that happens, then households decide how much to consume and save, uh, consume in the current period and all future periods, and to, and to save uh, going forward, and how much to work. So, so um, <clears throat> Now we're going to do uh, nominal contracts, but it's not, uh, you know, we're not meeting pairwise. We're all meeting in, a, in one big market. And so we have to decide on uh, what, what nominal interest rates should we put on these, uh, on our borrowing. For, and these are one period loans, by the way. So it's ultimate and variable rate uh, mortgages. They're recontracted every period. So what is the contract rate going to be? Well, it would just be the, um, <clears throat> Uh, the Euler equation that comes out of the uh, agent's problems, and this might look vaguely uh, familiar <coughs> on the right-hand side for log preferences and for the fact that you've got nominal uh, stuff in here. So what is this? This is essentially, you got an inverse here, so the nominal interest rate, this is the gross nominal interest rate, is essentially this expectation, which you could think of as expected nominal GDP growth for the economy. So this is going to have this nice feature that the nominal interest rate is equal to the expected rate of nominal GDP growth. Now the other thing about this is we've got lots of agents in this economy. Uh, uh, we've got agents uh, within a cohort. We've got a whole lot of agents, so there, there's an I here. They are actually all going to have the same expectation as this guy here, and so we don't have to worry about the, um, about the I. You've also got people that are born at other dates, uh, date T minus 1 or T minus 2 or T minus 240. However, those guys also have exactly the same expectation in the equilibrium we study. So we don't have to worry about that. We only have to look at one of, one of these expectations. We don't have to look at them all. And then what does the policymaker do? Again, uh, nature moves first, and then the policymaker has to decide how to set P. And so the policymaker is going to follow this price level rule here. And this price level rule says uh, this is the realized value of the growth rate of uh, productivity in the economy. And this nominal interest rate is the expectation on the previous slide. Uh, so the policymaker is going to adjust the price level by uh, how far off the um, uh, 
sort of the expectation of not only GDP growth was compared to uh, what real GDP is real GDP growth that would be expected not only GDP growth on the top. So this, if you take this, uh, just just to fix ideas in your head, if you take this policy rule, substitute it back into the into the household's problems, you're going to provide perfect insurance to the households, and that's why this is going to be the optimal uh, monetary policy. Um, there, some of you might know these papers by uh, Kevin Sheedy at LSE, Evan Koenig at the Dallas uh, Fed. This is very similar to uh, what they have in their papers on nominal GDP targeting and it recommended particularly this Sheedy paper, which was very extensive about uh, lots of ideas about nominal GDP targeting as optimal monetary policy. So what happens in, uh, if you take that rule and substitute it into the agent's problems, solve those problems, households will um, come out, consume equal amounts of available production given their productivity. So the so-called equity share contracting, and we know equity share contracting is optimal when preferences are homothetic. So this is what's going on. So I just want to make sure that we're clear on this now. So you've got let's suppose we're all doctors, so we're going to have a relatively high productivity profile over our lifetimes, but we're at different stages in the life cycle. So I might be at a stage where I have relatively low productivity, but you're at a stage where you have relatively high productivity. What's going to happen under this is we're going to consume the same amount at every day, even as we move through the life cycle and we have different amounts because we're going to, we're going to perfectly share uh, the economic pie that's available, okay? Then there would be other uh, people that are gonna be skilled laborers. They're gonna have much lower uh, productivity profile, but all the skilled laborers, no matter where they are in their life cycle, are gonna consume uh, the same amount also. So they're also equity share contracting. And both groups are contracting at the same interest rate, so there's no incentive for, uh, so markets are also in equilibrium. Um, perfect insurance. Uh, of course, it is a stochastic economy, so when you get to the next period, there's going to be a bigger economic pie, but there's going to be equity share contracting out of that economic pie. And then later periods are going to have much higher, uh, because it's a growing economy, the pie is going to be much bigger. It's all going to be shared equally in the way I just described. So that's the argument about why, uh, without going into more math than that, about why this is optimal policy in this uh, setting. And uh, lots of good things are happening uh, because of the log preferences and the symmetry. One thing that's happening is everybody's consumption growth rate, rich and poor, young and old, everybody's consumption growth rate is equal to this stochastic rate of growth of the economy as a whole. So, you know, it's a very nice feature of the, of the economy. But the main thing about this paper is we've got heterogeneity, lots of heterogeneity within cohorts, and so let me talk about that. So you're coming into the economy, you've got a bunch of people uh, every quarter uh, that are age 20, and just to fix ideas now, you're talking about something like the United States, you'd be talking about a million new uh, entrants every quarter, something like that. That's kind of the scale that you're talking about. So we're going to have a continuum of agents actually in every every cohort, and they're going to draw a scaling factor x from that uniform distribution, and they're going to uh, get a life cycle productivity profile that's a scaled version of the baseline profile, which is this E S here, and. This xi parameter will determine how much scaling there's going to be. If xi is one, everybody gets the baseline. If xi is six and a half, which is what we're going to choose, and some people are going to get six and a half times the baseline, other people are going to get one over six and a half times the baseline. And um, so there is idiosyncratic risk in this economy, but it's all born uh, when you hit age 20. So if you look at Iagari type uh, models, uh, what they will do is say, well, okay, you're gonna have these shocks that hit you all through your lifetime. But here we're just saying there's one shock and it hits you as you enter the model. And we take that to be a metaphor for all the schooling and uh, that you might get through parenting or through uh, formal schooling, 
before age 20, uh, and maybe an aid ability as well. If you look at Hug at Ventura and your own, we like to cite this paper, they say that uh, most of the differences are, uh, are already apparent at age 20, and if you want to predict uh, age 23 in their paper, if you want to predict lifetime earnings uh, and you know a vector of characteristics at age 23, you can have a real good prediction of uh, what they're going to do over the life cycle. So we're taking an extreme version of Hug at Ventura your own and saying, let's just do that and skip the idiosyncratic shocks that occur after. Um, we can do this guy here. You can actually, we've got a uniform distribution there. You can actually do a log normal distribution. So now people would come in and get the baseline profile, and some people would be arbitrarily poor and arbitrarily rich if you do the log, log normal. We're actually going to be able to do that as well and get the Gini coefficients uh, for that. So we'll take a look. At that. And here's our baseline uh, profile. Uh, we're not really arguing that this has to be the profile, but it does meet our symmetry assumptions. And it looks, uh, we didn't have to work very hard to get our Gini coefficients, but if you want to do other, other uh, profiles, you, you can do it. So once you get your profile, then you're stuck with it for your whole life. Uh, and you know, just to get the hang of this, that you're, you get these units uh, at every point in the life cycle. You can sell these units on a competitive market at the going wage and also decide how much to work. That's going to determine your income for that period. But you can't move the period, you can't move your productivity from one period to the next. You're stuck with the amount that you have in that particular period. So here's a picture, and we're getting into the pictures here. Most of the rest of the talk is, is, is pictures. So this doesn't tell you very much, but uh, just to get the hang of this, this is, uh, you, got two, you live for 241 periods uh, across here. You have an exact middle period here, period 120 in your life. Here's how many units you're gonna get if you get the baseline profile. You're gonna get, uh, and, and basically you're gonna have 50% you know, more units in the middle part of life than you do at the beginning or the end uh, of life. And um, that's actually not too much of a difference from what you would see in calibrated uh, models. But it's critical that this is perfectly uh, symmetric. If it's not perfectly symmetric, you're going to have to do more work to calculate the equilibrium. But uh, that's just the baseline profile. So now we've got all these other, other guys uh, were awarded scaled versions of that baseline profile. So you've got, um, and we set our scaling parameter six and a half here. So some people are getting that profile times six and a half. So they're way up here at the top, and other people are getting that profile divided by six and a half. So they're getting a profile way down here. So at any, another thing about these pictures is you could think of them as what do I get over my life cycle, but you can also think of them as uh, what's going on in the economy at a point in time is a cross section. So at any point in time, you know, you've got, you've got somebody here, this is, about, this is about age 35, and you've got some people age 35 very low productivity, some people age 35 with very high productivity, you know, all over the place. This whole blue blob is, is the productivity in the economy at any point in time. Uh, we have, uh, you can figure out the stationary equilibrium of this. Uh, this is uh, very standard. And the main theorem is that uh, if you've got symmetry and you've got this price level rule, then the real interest rate is equal to the growth rate of output growth in the economy. The corollary is equity share contracting. So you can prove all these things. So let's take a look at what, what, this, what does this equilibrium uh, really look like? <laughs> okay, so um, one of the really cool things, I think, is log log preferences, remember? So everyone is gonna work the same number of hours over their life cycle in the same pattern no matter if they're rich or if they're poor. So the doctor, 
this is hours worked over the life cycle. You're going to work very little early in the life cycle, <coughs> very little late in the life cycle. We didn't push this all the way to retirement. So we, we've got inferior solutions by choosing the math the way that we did. But basically, not working very much here, not working very much here. You work a lot when you're productive. Okay, But that's true whether you're a doctor or a, or a manual laborer. In fact, everybody works 40 hours. Every single person, no matter how, whether you're scaled way up or scaled way down. This is the leisure, so it's the inverse, is how much uh, leisure you're taking. This is a calibrated number to get, uh, so that they spend about 19% uh, of the time working over the, over the life cycle. So we actually calibrated uh, to that. So, um, so when you're in the middle of the life cycle, and this does not depend on the shock, does not depend on the shock, okay? So uh, it just depends on the stage of life. So if you're in the Great Depression, but you're in the middle of your life cycle, you're still gonna work 40 hours if you can. So, um, so here's the income mass, uh, labor income mass in this economy. So now you've got people that don't work that much when they're young, they don't work that much when they're old, they work a lot in middle age, and in addition, they're more productive when they're middle age. They're working well, the sun shines, right? So what does this do? This blows up this uh, middle part of, uh, of the distribution here. But at any point in time, you can find somebody that's earning you know, very little, uh, and it's pretty young. You can find other people that are middle-aged and earning very little, other people that are earning tons of money here, and all kinds of people all over the place. So we're going to calculate the Gini coefficient uh, for that guy. Uh, <clears throat> so again, this is, uh, you can think of these as cross-section now. So this is uh, the very youngest guy, uh, the very oldest guy, you got the same income distribution in the blue there. This red is how much they're consuming. So remember that all the doctors, the guys that are at the very top there, those guys are all equity sharing. <clears throat> so they're gonna, uh, they're all consuming that amount there, the very top part of the red box. And the middle guy, the, the blue line here, kind of the median, uh, uh, productivity profile. These people are all different ages, but they're all consuming exactly the same amount, this red line here. And then you've got your uh, very low income people here, and uh, they also are, uh, they're consuming that very lowest line there. Uh, but they're also equity share contracting with everyone else that's on their same productivity profile. All right? So, um, so we're going to calculate the Gini coefficient of this red box too, because that'll be the consumption Gini uh, for this economy. And then here's my favorite picture. This is the asset holding picture in this economy. It's a closed economy, so borrowing and lending has to add up. Um, you've got the, the exact midpoint here at uh, period 120. These are the borrowers over here. Uh, they have negative net assets. These are the lenders over here. These people are basically saving for retirement. This is basically age 65 in this economy. This is basically age 35 in this economy. So the period of maximum indebtedness would be right around the time when you're trying to borrow to um, buy your house. Uh, <clears throat> so they accumulate. Uh, uh, these guys are going to go further and further into debt up until uh, period 60, uh, 60 quarters. Then they're going to start accumulating. That's going to peak right around age 65. Then you're going to run down your assets. But uh, some people are richer than other people uh, because they have the higher endowment profile. So the doctors are actually going to borrow more uh, at this stage of the life cycle, and they're actually going to save more at that stage of the life cycle. The manual laborers are going to do uh, much less of this. They're going to be up here, and they're going to only save uh, a little bit. But the blue, now when you think about, well, what's the Gini coefficient of that? Usually when we think about Gini coefficients, we don't think about negative uh, net assets. So you don't consider the borrowing part. So you just go uh, calculate the Gini coefficient of the asset holders in the economy.
I guess I have the Gini coefficient here, it's a 72. <laughs> All right, and then, uh, gee, we want to calculate income genies, uh, but what do we mean by income? Do we mean just labor income, or do we mean labor and capital income, which would be this guy here, or the non-negative component of total income? So we'll do it all three ways, and I'll throw, show you the pictures here. Here's la labor income plus non-negative capital income. Um, so on this side of the picture, it's just labor income, but these people over here also have some savings, so they, uh, they have to report higher income, so that distorts your picture a little bit. And here's uh, non-negative uh, total income. Um, I'm not going to dwell on that here. All right, so inequality. Let's think about the U.S. data. Uh, so in the U.S. data, um, the consumption, first of all, this model naturally ranks the financial wealth genie and the income genie and the consumption genie. And people universally, I think, agree that the financial wealth genie is, in the U.S. is very high. The income genie is lower, but still high. Consumption genie is the lowest. According to Heathcote Perry Violante, uh, the consumption genie is about a point or 32 percent income genie. You can do pre-taxes and transfers, uh, 51 percent. We don't have any taxes and transfers here, so we're not we're not looking at this number. We're looking at that number for the income genie, and we've got three ways to calculate that. And then you got this financial wealth genie. Extremely high in the U.S. is at 80. In the model, um, we're going to do it two ways. We're going to use that uniform distribution, but we could also do this log normal. I actually thought the log normal would be able to get whatever gene we wanted to get, but um, it doesn't work. Uh, that log normal will allow for arbitrarily poor households. So you take that productivity profile and scale it down by, let's say, a factor of 100, or you know, think of the distribution. And ag arbitrarily rich households, um, without getting into corner solutions, so it's a, it's a nice piece of math. Uh, you can actually still figure out the, uh, the Gini coefficient. So I'm going to show you the genies here. So here's uniform distribution, which is most of all the pictures I've been showing you. Here's a log normal distribution instead. Uh, so the consumption genie basically uh, comes out just right. Uh, the income genie, well, you've got three ways to measure the income, but if you, if you want to go with this middle one, it's going to be just right. And the financial wealth genie is going to be a little bit shy of the, uh, of the 80 that we need there. But I thought it was interesting. We didn't really get much out of the log normal. I thought we'd get more out of the log normal, but we did. Um, but the bit, in the big picture, um, basically, you have plenty of heterogeneity in this economy, at least the stylized way that we've done it. And you can still characterize <coughs> optimal monetary policy, and it's going to look like normal GDP targeting. And not only that, everyone in the economy is going to like this uh, monetary policy because it's solving a problem that they face, which is the <coughs> is the friction that they face from non-state contingent nominal contracting. So this is informative too. This shows how the Gini coefficients change if we change the dispersion parameter. We used a value of six and a half here, so we got a consumption genie here, an income genie here, and a financial wealth genie there. If you want to go higher, you can go higher, but there are limits to how much uh, how much these genie coefficients are going to go up. So basically, uh, you're not going to get any more by by choosing more and more dispersion in that uh, in across the uniform distribution. Just. Just so you can fix ideas here, why is this thing going to zero? This is because uh, if if xi comes all the way down here, then um, there's no dispersion in the economy at all, and so there's no consumption in flow. <coughs> Should be at a one. This is a one. 
<clears throat> okay, the last part is just to talk about um, policy a little bit. And this has been a little bit abstract. I showed you a policy rule, which was a price level policy rule. But that isn't how we talk about policy in the Financial Times. In the Financial Times, we say, uh, what's the interest rate that the central bank is going to choose? Well, you can do that um, because the contracts are made understanding policy, but the policy is made understanding the contracts. So if you figure out the fixed point of that problem, you're going to be able to talk about the interest rate uh, policy instead of the price level policy. So we're going to do that. Um, this is just a little bit about uh, what's going on in this model. The, when everyone's meeting every day. They're wondering, they're going to borrow a little bit every day. Uh, they're <coughs> lenders. Everyone's meeting in a big market. They're wondering what nominal interest rate they should agree to. The nominal interest rate is always the expected rate of nominal GDP growth. Um, the Wixellian natural real rate of interest would be the aggregate gross uh, productivity growth rate, lambda, a uh, stochastic object in this model. And then the policy is going to be to ratify the contract ex post. So you guys agreed to 4% nominal interest rate last period. That's because you were expecting 2% real growth. It turned out real growth was only 1%, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna set the price level to make your contract uh, be correct or, or look ex post uh, correct, ratified. So that makes the real rate of interest equal to the aggregate productivity growth rate. That's the wix LA natural rate of interest. So this works just like the New Keynesian uh, model. It's not surprising that it would work that way. Uh, in the basic New Keynesian model, you're getting back to first best. That means you're making sure that the real interest rate is the correct real interest rate for that economy. You're doing exactly the same thing here. You're using your policy tool to make sure that the real interest rate in this economy is the correct real interest rate for this economy, which is the uh, stochastic rate of growth of this economy. Why is this nominal GDP targeting? Uh, if you didn't have any serial correlation in the shock, uh, what you'd be doing every period is put, you'd have a nominal GDP path, and you'd be putting the economy exactly back onto that nominal GDP path every period. If you have some serial correlation in the shocks, then it takes a little bit longer to get back to that nominal GDP path. So that's the sense in which is the nominal GDP targeting. And I think, Critically for me, <laughs> are we saying something crazy? I don't think so. Nominal interest rates fall when there's a recession. Real rates fall when there's a recession. Nominal rates go up in good times. Real rates go up in good times. So um, there's nothing unusual in that sense. So here's a picture of uh, what goes on in this economy. Uh, you've got the stochastic rate of uh, te technological growth or labor productivity growth. We've got that set at 1.02. These are all gross rates. And then uh, there's a period of a shock, and this goes down to one. So it's a two percentage point shock to um, uh, the growth rate of the economy. And uh, uh, the policy is to ratify the nominal interest rate that was agreed to last period. So nothing happens to the nominal interest rate in the period of the shock. That's this, uh, this line here. So that's, we've got that at 5%. So what do we have to do to make sure that that happens, given that this happened? You've got to raise the price level up. So you go, this is the counter-cyclical price level movement. This went down, so price level goes up. Price level goes up, sorry. Inflation goes up also. Then in the period, in the period after that, now they, uh, everyone gets to contract on a new, uh, you know, contract a new, uh, given the new situation. And the new situation is productivity growth is low and is only expected to return to steady state slowly. So because of that, they're going to contract on a relatively low nominal interest rate, and it's going to return to the steady state slowly. And in the, because of that, uh, the price level act, or the inflation rate actually falls in the period after the shock and then returns to steady state slowly. So what happens in recession? 
real interest rate falls, nominal interest rate falls, but not immediately in the period after the shock. Uh, inflation immediately goes up, but ultimately goes lower and, and comes back to steady state. These look not too different from, uh, from what you would get from standard uh, sorts of stories about uh, monetary policy. All right, so enough yammering. I'll open it up for questions here. Um, <clears throat> this paper says that U.S. inequality is due partly to life cycle effects. You've got people at different stages of the life cycle with different productivities, and partly to uh, dispersion within cohort dispersion in those productivity profiles. But no matter who you are in, the, in this model, uh, you've got a problem of trying to smooth your life cycle consumption uh, because, and, and poor people face this problem, rich people face this problem, middle income people face this problem. So they all face this problem. So they all want the credit market to work you know, perfectly. So uh, they want to be able to overcome that credit market friction. If you told them ahead of time, this is what my policy is going to be, then they would say, yeah, I like that policy because I'm going to get it on ahead of time without knowing my shocks. I know I'm going to get the best allocation of resources that I can get in this stochastic world. So the Monetary Authority can uh, fix this uh, through um, nominal GDP targeting. So therefore, this is optimal monetary policy for the masses. A lot of people ask me, well, does monetary policy affect income inequality or consumption inequality? Well, yeah, because if you didn't follow this policy, you'd have incomplete markets. <coughs> consumption distribution would be different. The income distribution would be different. The financial wealth holding distribution would be different. And labor, uh, labor supply would also be different. So all, if you didn't follow this policy, you would muck up all those things, and so you'd have a bad allocation of resources. So by following this policy, yes, you're affecting all those things. So I'll stop there. So thanks, you've been very patient. In this Uh, uh, you can get those form solutions through that uh, in a single uh, key assumption, which is the symmetry assumption, uh, which then brings me to the question. So there must be some micro evidence on this, right? So you know, is is product are productivity profiles symmetric over the life cycle or are they not? Uh, um, <clears throat> they aren't perfectly uh, symmetric, and uh, if you look at the calibrated examples. In the literature, you know, there are different things out there, but they're not, it's not wildly at odds with the data. I mean, people are more productive. They have peak earning years. They're more productive in the middle part of life, not very productive in their early 20s, not very productive late in life. So, in that sense, uh, it's generally true, but it's probably not going to be exactly uh, symmetric. So that means you'd have to, if you wanted to put something in that wasn't quite symmetric or, or even was somewhat off, now you gotta go to the computer and calculate the solution. But I'm telling you, this is a great baseline because now you don't have to go to the, you don't have to go to the computer and you can see what's happening. <clears throat> you know, by and large, most, uh, you know, agents are heterogeneous, but their uh, productivity profiles were, uh, over the lifetime were sort of similar. Yeah. then you would probably be able to go to the computer and do that. Um, yeah. By the way, another thing you can do, so we scaled, we just took the one profile and scaled it up and down. But you could have other profiles. You could have like some, somebody's got a, a very peaky profile. Somebody's got actually a completely flat profile. You can have that. That will, All these profiles meet symmetry assumptions, so you could have different profiles in that sense. What that would give you is you'd have people that appear to be uh, moving up the income distribution and down the income distribution because they're on different profiles compared to other people. <clears throat> uh, I hope maybe I can ask two questions, somewhat related. Uh, so one question is just, I guess I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to understand a little bit better the nature of the exercise. So are you, is it sort of meant as a kind of somewhat descriptive exercise to say, you know, with these assumptions about financial market incompleteness, I can generate a motive for monetary policy, which if the central bank carries out optimally looks a lot like what central banks actually do. 
So all these things that we hear about, you know, for the reasons for interest rate setting, they're kind of really fundamentally, this is the story that we should have in mind. And then the second and sort of maybe somewhat related question is. Well, maybe I'll, can I just answer that one? So I think in my mind, there's a literature on heterogeneous agent macroeconomics. The people in that literature are not actually saying this, but they're kind of saying, if you got serious about putting heterogeneity in the model, then the kinds of things central banks are talking about are way off, way off from what you would need. You can't, you don't, would not have a claim to, to uh, optimality. So I wanted to say, well, I, I've got at least one example <laughs> that has a lot of heter heterogeneity and where uh, central banks can do uh, something simple, a simple policy. It's kind of an older view about monetary policy. I'm going to follow a simple monetary policy. It's basically going to be lower interest rates and recessions and raise interest rates at other times. And that's going to provide a good solution for uh, rich and poor, young and old. So I guess this, this already goes some, some way towards addressing my second question, which was, suppose that in the model, in addition to the contracting incompleteness that the model has, there's also a sort of more traditional price setting of a price rigidity friction or something like that. I mean, so immediately the, there's going to be some tension for monetary policy, right? Or you could imagine situations, at least, in which these sort of two objectives that the policymaker is trying to achieve are get into conflict. And I imagine that this is where some of this discussion about monetary policy for the masses really becomes particularly salient. So if you follow, suppose you said, I don't like, Jim, I don't like your known GDP target. I just want stable prices. So kind of Milton Friedman, right? Just a, a stable price policy. Since you can control the price level over a period, why don't you just just control it every period and just set it to something. Uh, that would be an incomplete markets policy, and we've actually got uh, new, new stuff. Uh, you can do the linear approximation to this, and you can show how all the different agents will consume different amounts, and they will start working different amounts because they want to self-insure against the fact that they've been hit by a shock and not been completely insulated from that shock. So we can show all that kind of stuff. So. Um, so it would be um, bad to pursue some other policy other than the one I put up here. Please. Can I ask a I, I think it's a really neat model, and then you can have lots of heterogeneity, and it's very nice that you can match up um, your Gini coefficients with what, what they look like in the US. Um, but it's, it's sort of important that although there's a lot of heterogeneity in, in, in it, a significant sense, there's very little heterogeneity because everybody has the same kind of profile of earnings, just people are scaled up versions or down of, of the same person. And that's important because everybody borrows at the same point in their life and they all repay debt at the same point in their life. And I wondered whether you thought that one, one form of heterogeneity which, which deviates from that is the following. My guess is, I don't know whether it's true, my guess is that on the whole, pe people who have low average lifetime incomes have much less steeper earnings profiles than people that have high income. So somebody who becomes a corporate lawyer is, is earning gazillions in their 50s and 60s maybe, and they weren't earning very much in their 20s. Somebody who's a physical laborer, their earnings may peak, I don't know, in their 30s, and then they kind of just get tired. It's difficult to do this stuff, and it tails off quite a lot later. So kind of different profile. If that were true, if that were true, I guess you'd find rather strangely perhaps in some ways, that the people that relatively were, were high savers were the poor people, and the people that borrowed a lot and then repaid it later in life were the rich people, but they, they, they wouldn't have the same profile of borrowing and lending right. over their life. If, if, if that's crudely true, would, would you think they would then not agree on the right on the same monetary policy? After all, they've got different profiles of debt now. Okay, so the way the math works, I can tell you how the math works, you actually can do what you're describing. So you could have uh, you know, kind of manual laborers that, that have very low levels of uh, productivity profile, and it just slightly goes up and then slightly goes down. If you're willing to maintain symmetry, right. that'll be fine. And then you've got some other guy who maybe even starts below the manual labor at right. age 20. It goes way up. Like but goes way up like this right. and it comes down. If you're willing to maintain symmetry, all this will go through. 
Right, but I think this, I guess the reason that's right, and it obviously is right, but I guess the reason that's right is that as long as it's symmetric and it, you know, it goes up and it comes down and it mm. always goes up and comes down for everybody, then the periods when people borrow and the people when the periods repay debt would be common, even though the slopes going up and down are yeah. different. Right? That yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if you can do trickier things like have some people peak early, but then offset by other people who peak symmetrically yeah. later or something like that. I don't know if you can do stuff like that. But I can see um, it gets tricky. It gets yeah, messy. Messy. yeah. You can certainly compute those things. There's no yeah. question you could compute all, yeah. all kinds of equilibria. So it's not a matter of that. I think it's whether you can still get the pen, pay, uh, pay right. pencil uh, type yeah. solution. So the uh, you know the literature has <coughs> an idiosyncratic risk beyond uh, you know, what you've got here is just in the first period of life you're you're hit with something and then you go from there, but the literature would say no you get additional shocks all through your life. I think if those are IID shocks you can actually push all this through. Um, so it's really the only thing that's different between this and an IID guard model is the serial correlation. In the idiosyncratic risk. <clears throat> Please. Um, the, I'm trying to figure out do the shocks actually affect the Gini coefficients as well? Does the distribution of the degree of uncertainty, does that come into the Gini calculation? If the everyone's consumption is moving together, are we just all sort of scaling um, down? So it, is there is that actually having any effect on that? Uh, let, me, let me try to get to what I think you're talking about. So you want to know if I change this distribution? Yeah. Well, it didn't change very much going from a uniform distribution to a log normal. No, uh, sorry, the uh, the shocks to the growth rate. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. So if we change the shock to the growth rate, then it change the gene. I don't think it matters. Because everyone's just going up and down together, aren't they? Everybody? That's right. So there's just. Uh, what well, would change things some is if you allowed the zero bound, because uh, there would be situations if there was a large negative shock and it was very persistent so that you expected uh, consumption growth to be negative the next quarter, since the nominal interest rate is the expected rate of nominal GDP growth, that would be a bad situation. That's a situation of the zero bound, and for that you gotta do something special, and the something special is just a have more inflation in that period. If I'm somebody who's accumulated a lot of assets, so I've accumulated so somebody in towards the end of their life. Yeah. So I've, I've accumulated real I've got effectively real savings at my because I want to finance my consumption. Mm -hmm. If you get a big negative shock at that point, so I'm expecting that to persist. Yeah, yeah. Suppose yeah. there's a big negative shock to growth. But I'm at the peak of those assets. Mm -hmm. Then I'm, so I've got too many, essentially, and I expect that to be going to persist to some extent. So I've got too much savings. You, so you're getting, yes, there are shocks, but the, the, the central the banker, the hero of central banker is coming to the rescue. And so you're saying the amount that you've saved is just the right amount, even though you got hit by I'll the just, shock. I'll just keep the same level of yeah. consumption for now. Okay. Yeah. No, what's, and what also is going to happen, uh, just to be clear on this now, suppose you were here and you got a big negative shock. Yeah, I mean, you're going to consume less, but everyone in the economy is going to consume less because the pie shrunk in that particular period. And that's still the best outcome that you can get because it's still equity share contract. Please. Um, I think it was the last slide. You, you say, um, does is uh, inequality affected? And you yeah. say yes. And you say um, it alters this. It alters this. It alters this. Yeah. And alters is a neutral term. It can go up or it can go down. Um, my intuition is that if you follow some other monetary policy, then inequality will be greater. Yeah. Uh, but that may not be generally true. Yeah, uh, maybe you could tell us. So we don't know that. We don't know that. I think that's true, but I, I don't. Um, 
you could only do that computationally because now you can't do the on paper solution anymore. But um, what we can show is that uh, it's a it's a worse outcome in welfare terms uh, to be living in the complete markets economy yeah. instead of the complete markets economy. But um, whether the Gini, to calculate the Gini coefficient for that, that would be some more work. So we haven't done that. But Please. But one of the other thoughts I had, and actually that slide's very relevant, is obviously inequality is not just in heterogeneity, so it's not just in real productivity, but you kind of a, there could be an inequality or heterogeneity in the starting assets, and that in itself could be correlated with heterogeneity in your yeah. productivity. So people who are high, high productivity also start with a large amount of factors and just correlate it. Yeah. What sort of implications do you think that would have for the way that the model evolves? So this is kind of classic OLG. We say that mm -hmm. there are no bequests and yeah. there's no, uh, uh, no initial assets. However, <clears throat> you are being handed this productivity profile, uh, which you're in the model anyway, you're randomly drawing this, but in life you wouldn't be randomly drawing it. It's like something about you know what your parents gave you in your upbringing and, uh, and investments in human capital like we were talking about uh, earlier. Uh, so in some ways, you're, you're coming in at this point with something. But it's, it's not actually financial assets, uh, but you're coming in with some, uh, with some amount of human capital. Also, from an economist's point of view, when you look at who's wealthy in this economy, you got to think about that productivity profile. And their expected lifetime earnings, and some you would have to make some calculation about that. That's really the wealth of the nation here is how what those uh, productivity profiles look like. Yeah, well, I think yeah, I can see the point that it's kind of bundled up in your effective outcome. I suppose the question then comes: if you change the utility function, so people don't have necessarily will have the same desire to earn over their lifetime. There's maybe a minimum standard for different people want to reach. And then they don't necessarily earn that much more on top, regardless of their income. And therefore, if you start off with large amounts of assets, you might not consume the same proportion. You might not work as hard. So there is some sort of like, so we want to treat we've them. got consumption down here. Yeah, <clears throat> and there is you could think of that as some minimum consumption, maybe. Mm -hmm. If you do large normal, this is act you're actually going to go. Yeah. Not not to zero, but uh, arbitrarily close to zero. Mm -hmm. So I don't, yeah. I don't know how to think about that. But you could put minimum consumption on there, and then have transfers or something like that mm -hmm. to to those people. Could do that. <clears throat> A little bit about fiscal policy. <clears throat> so um, look at this picture here. This says everyone works the same amount of hours at every stage in the life cycle, no matter if they're rich or poor. This means you can tax these guys, and uh, they won't change their hours. As long as you tax them like 10% every period of their life. If you did something like that, proportional uh, labor income taxation, then they will still work the 40 hours uh, in the middle of life, and they won't work very much at the beginning of the end. And uh, you're going to get the same amount of output in the economy, and you're going to be able to fund your go whatever your government uh, uh, is. So you'd actually have optimal fiscal and monetary policy. The monetary policy would be nominal GDP targeting, and the fiscal <laughs> policy would be a linear labor tax. I find this very instructive because I read a lot of optimal tax papers, <laughs> and it makes it seem this provides a base case where you could think about uh, a way to finance the government in non distortion without lump sum taxing. Of course, lump sum is always, lump sum you can always do things, but this would, uh, this is eliciting the same labor supply that doesn't depend on the <clears throat> Yeah. However, in your model, you don't really have a government, really. It doesn't there is have no any purpose, right? No so government at there's all. There's no, no purpose of taxes. Uh, no, but you would add, you would add something like a, a good that, or the, the Huns are invading, so you have to have an army. You <laughs> could take 10% of GDP, and, and now you've got to fund that with the uh, least amount of distortion, something like that. You, you might have educated 
But then we might want to educate them. Yes. <laughs> you may want to ask schools, since we're assuming schools. You know, so the, the heterogeneity is, is very important, and it kind of drives this optimality of the policy and the choice. But the, the, you know, electronic, it's very difficult to implement this you know, nominal GDP targeting below the you know, things associated with measurement and so on. And so I wondered if yeah. if you kind of thought about, I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty about this shock and how, how it's modeled and so the ideas that is it. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so you're, it's, 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 a, it's a great point. You're bringing up the practical aspects. You know, can you really do anything like nominal GDP targeting? And I haven't talked anything about that. And I think, you know, for actual central bankers like me, this is a very tangible issue. The answer is probably no. Um, but I took some heart from the idea that the pictures at the end were, you know, recession hits, you lower. You lower the policy rate. You know, real rates go down, nominal rates go down. That sounds like what actual central banks do, so it doesn't look that different. Maybe in interest rates case, it doesn't look that different from what we actually do. Has to be done in the model. It has to be done in a particular way. Otherwise, you won't get to the right solution. But if you thought about an approximation to that, it would just be okay. Bad things happen. Lower interest rates. Good things happen. Raise interest rates. But there's something in the model that adjusts the prices. I mean, yeah, I mean the the, the policymaker here can just set the price level. Kind of after price. after seeing the shock, so it's you kind of get to see the shock and you get to set the price level. So it's a long way from from having control errors and slippage that would occur in actual policy making and how fast are you making those? Do you really get to see the shocks? All those kinds of issues, um, you know, are very tangible when you're actually making policy. Some of us would say you don't get to see any of the shocks. <laughs> so. Well, you guys have been great. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at, uh, at the Pan Muir House. And uh, what a great job in uh, restoring this beautiful uh, facility. So, uh, so thanks for having me today.